Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Today we're going to be finishing up, um, well, not finishing up metabolism. There's going to be one more part. It's going to be a little short, but we're on part four out of five for MCAT metabolism. So in terms of our agenda, here's what we've covered up to this point. We talked about digestion. We talked about glycolysis, primary dehydrogenase complex in the citric acid cycle in the first lecture. In the second lecture, we covered gluconeogenesis. We covered fermentation in the Cori cycle, and we covered glycogenesis and glycogenolysis. And then last time we covered the pentose phosphate pathway and the electron transport chain. So here's where we are, and then here's where we're going. The lipogenesis and lipogen uh, lipo lipolysis is gonna be covered today, the carnitine shuttle, beta oxidation, and fatty acid synthesis. So those are gonna be the focuses of our talk today. So very much on lipid metabolism as, as asked and advertised. And then here's what's coming up on the horizon. So for next week, we will cover steroid metabolism um, in very, very um, broad detail. So not, not a lot of detail on steroid metabolism, ketone bodies, uh, glucogenic and ketogenic amino acids and the urea cycle. So the last kind of four topics are a little bit more miscellaneous. We will see that they do tie, um, they do tie some things that we already talked about together um, as, as well as things that we'll talk about today. Intro to MCAT metabolism. So for anybody who hasn't seen one of these videos or hasn't been to one of these sessions before, metabolism is generally one of the most difficult topics for uh, MCAT students to master. However, a thorough understanding of metabolism will reinforce a lot of fundamental topics such as ochem reactions, reduction oxidation, enzyme classes, bioenergetics, macromolecules, cell structure, digestion, and more. Um, cell cell uh, you know, regulation in a cell as well, lots of other things. So we're gonna be going into a good amount of detail when it comes to these metabolic processes today at beta oxidation, fatty acid synthesis, and the carnitine shuttle. So I will try to point out when we're talking about certain things just for reinforcement as opposed to things that are actually testable. So we will cover a lot of things that are just to help re like higher level things that are out of scope that will reinforce the things that are actually in scope. Tips for metabolism. So if you're trying to understand metabolism, don't just do it by sort of a discrete understanding of individual reactions and memorizing enzyme names, memorizing reactants and products actually connect those enzyme names with the substrate and product names, as well as the bond changes that occur between them. Look for patterns. Uh, so we're gonna emphasize a lot of patterns, especially today is where we're gonna see a lot of patterns that occur between beta oxidation, for instance, and uh, the citric acid cycle. And we like to, uh, we like to also make, make patterns uh, when it comes to things that are not as obvious, such as, I think for instance, when we were talking about glycogenesis and we had this protein called glycogenin, we compare glycogenin to like an RNA primer in DNA replication. So we'll try to emphasize lots and lots of patterns. So again, that we're helping to build this framework that all of this information can be, that can, all this information can be housed in. Ask, why is this happening again? Often. So I like to say, pretend like you're a child. You know, a child will ask you why, and to your follow-up, they will ask you again why, or how, or what, and continue asking why. Zoom out of the the details, zoom out of the details, try to think about what is the big picture. So why is this individual step happening? Oh, because from A to Z, these are some of the changes that need to happen. So then it makes more sense as to why changes C to D and E to F are happening. A narrative understanding is superior to brute force memorization. So I think it's pretty clear by now what we mean by a narrative understanding as opposed to brute force memorization. If you can understand something occurring from A to Z, it's actually easier than memorizing the individual like A to B and you know, K to L and P to Q, right? Um, and just general tips for the MCAT, I advise you to get a whiteboard or, or something like a whiteboard where you can uh, be continuously erasing and then refilling things in so that you're, you're testing uh, your ability to, for instance, if you were to erase all the enzyme names in glycolysis, could you fill them back in? And then if you were to erase all the intermediates in glycolysis, could you then fill them back in? And you could apply this to the amino acids as well. Can I remember all of the one letter abbreviations? If I have the three letter abbreviations, the side chains, can I then remember all the side chains based on the one letter and the three letter abbreviations? If you do that enough iterations, it just becomes impossible to forget. All right, so um, overview of fat catabolism. Main types of lipids in the body. So we have triglycerides, 
which will be three fatty acids and glycerol. And we can call these triacyl glycerols. Does anybody remember what is the type of bond that is made that connects the fatty acid and the glycerol? What type of functional group? You have an acid and glycerol is an alcohol, right? So ester, perfect. And then likewise, we have phospholipids. Uh, phospholipids will also be glycerol. They'll have two fatty acids, but then it'll have one polar head. We also call phospholipids phosphoacyl glycerol. So notice we have acyl and acyl. So acyl is a word that's gonna come up a lot today. So we wanna be familiar with what that means. An acyl is a, fatty, is, a, is a type of carboxylic acid derivative. So a carboxylic acid derivative could be an ester, could be an acid chloride, for instance. And then steroids as well. So steroids are also going to be one of the main types of lipids found in the body. And we can always recognize these guys based on their tetracyclic ring skeleton. So do you remember how many members are in the rings of a cholesterol or a steroid? So there's four rings and then three of them have how many members? And the last one has how many members? Yep, so three of them has six and one of them has five, perfect. And then we also will find in the body free fatty acids. So free fatty acids will be found as carboxylates. So deprotonated at physiological pH and they'll have hydrocarbon tails. And we do make fatty acids into triglycerides and phospholipids by linking them with glycerol. Now, one thing that we're gonna notice today when we do ATP calculations is the fatty acid catabolism produces significantly more energy than carbohydrate catabolism. So why would that be? I think it stores more and it's a longer fatty acid. It has a longer carbon chain. Uh-huh, they do have a long carbon chain. A lot of them are a lot, have a lot more carbons than a, um, a glucose or a sugar would. And so is, is catabolism oxidative or reductive? Is catabolism oxidative or reductive? I think it's oxidative, it's oxidative. It's oxidative, right? Okay. Because we turn uh, we turn all of our carbons into CO two by the end of the processes. So, is a sugar when it comes into the body versus a fatty acid? Which one would be already more oxidized, the sugar or the fatty acid? Well, the the yes, yeah, she is right. Yeah, sugars are, right? So sugars already have a hydroxyl group on all of their carbons. So they are already more oxidated. They're more, already more oxidized. So we have less energy we can get out of them because a fatty acid is most reduced, right? Perfect. So because catabolism is oxidative and sugars are more oxidized prior to metabolism than fatty acids, yeah. So it is because fatty acids are more reduced. Steroid catabolism. So we're not gonna talk too much about, we're not gonna really talk about steroid catabolism today, but just in general, Animals can't typically digest or, or can't typically uh, complete catabolism of steroids. What will happen is they'll turn it into bile salts in the liver using cytochrome P450 enzymes. And then the bile salts will be used to do what? Like, what do we say? What are bile salts used for? Emulsifying fats, perfect, yeah. So uh, we will be able to use steroids after we start to metabolize them as bile salts. So we'll look, at it. we'll look at those next week, of course. And then eventually the bile salts will be modified further, such as they'll be hydroxylated or phosphorylated to increase their water solubility. And then they'll be eliminated via excretion. Any questions on this slide? Yes, feel free. Uh, should you be looking at the handout? I haven't passed the handout yet. Um, so I don't, I guess not. <laughs> yeah, uh, the handout will be posted uh, after this recording. And if you're watching this on YouTube, feel free to request the handout. All right, so lipogenesis and lipolysis. So I like this diagram a lot. It connects a lot of the different pathways that we've been talking about already. Lipogenesis, which is gonna be in red here, is the production of triglycerides from glycerol and fatty acids. And so under control of which hormone would we be doing lipogenesis? 
which hormone would stimulate lipogenesis? So storage of fats. The insulin, yes, insulin will do that. Because when we have insulin, it's usually typically after we just had a meal, right? So after we had a meal, we have excess abundant energy and we need to store a lot of that energy rather than just excrete it so that we can use it when we don't have an excess of abundance of energy. Perfect. So insulin is going to stimulate this pathway of forming triglycerides. And then we have lipolysis is gonna be in green on this diagram. So lipolysis will be hydrolysis of triglycerides into glycerol and fatty acids. And um, both of those can enter the circulation. So we have stored triglycerides here breaking into glycerol and fatty acids. Fatty acids, as we're gonna talk about in detail today, will undergo beta oxidation and can then eventually become acetyl-CoA after beta oxidation has finished and enter the citric acid cycle so where we can get additional energy from. And they can also become ketone bodies, which is something that we'll be covering next week. Glycerol, on the other hand, can actually enter into glycolysis. So it'll, it'll enter into glycolysis. It'll become glycerol 3-phosphate and then dihydroxyacetone phosphate. We, we talked a little bit about this last week and then can become glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. This is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. I'm not a big fan of how they, um, how they named it here. And then it can become pyruvate and then acetyl-CoA. So one question for you here would be, can we make uh, fatty acids using glucose? Can we make fatty acids using glucose? Or using byproducts? We sure can, right? As we can see here, after glycolysis, we know that we get acetyl-CoA as, as the pyruvate enters the mitochondria under action of pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And then acetyl-CoA can then be used in, as we'll talk about at the end of the today, today's in fatty acid synthesis to make new fatty acids. Now, how about this? Can we use uh, fats? Can we use fats to make glucose? Does it go the other way? It does not, right? So acetyl-CoA, from pyruvate is a one-way reaction. So once we've broken down fatty acids into acetyl-CoA, we can no longer make, or we, we can't just make them back into glucose. And as we'll talk about next week, this is gonna be the purpose of ketone bodies, is making sources of energy for, especially which organ under conditions of low blood glucose. Ketone bodies are for nourishing which organ? Nourishing the brain, yeah. So the brain runs on glucose. And if we do not have glucose, if we're under low glucose conditions, then as we'll talk about next week, ketone bodies will play a role here. And so this is because we can't make glucose from fatty acids. So uh, lipolysis, that would be under control of which hormones? Lipolysis would be promoted by which hormones? Think of at least four. That should be glucagon. Glucagon, that's one. What else? The cat knows the answer, <laughs> he's screaming it. Cortisol. Cortisol is another one, good. What else? What would be another hormone that tells us that we need to um, get more energy mobilized? I think growth hormone is well. Growth hormone, that's a great one, yep. And then there's one more. A greener corticotropic hormone, well, that one um, will lead to cortisol, right? So this is one that, for instance, like if I needed to a lot of energy because I'd had to run from a bear, let's say, what hormone would, my, would be taking over in my body? When I'm running from a bear? Epi, 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 epi. Yep, exactly, perfect. So these are gonna be the main four hormones that will stimulate lipolysis and mobilize free fatty acids to get to, especially to our muscles, so they can do beta oxidation on it. And so these, yeah, these are gonna be our main hormones, so norepinephrine, norepinephrine. Questions here? So, uh, sort of another view here, and this one's getting into a little bit more molecular detail for lipolysis. So we have some hormone, such as norepinephrine binding to a, how do we know this is a G protein coupled receptor? Let's pretend we don't see this GS. 
what tells us that this receptor is a GPCR? Transmembrane alpha helices. Transmembrane alpha helices. I don't know if we would be able to directly infer that here, but that could be a way. And yes. Oh, based on the photo. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. sorry. Uh, based on the photo. So yeah, cyclic AMP. So we have a denylyl cyclase, which we're going to make ATP into cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP in a G protein coupled receptor pathway is then always going to activate protein kinase A. And so this is, this is what always happens when, in, at least for MCAT purposes, when it comes to cyclic AMP and then protein kinase A, we'll go ahead and depending on the cell type, it'll phosphorylate different things, right? It's a kinase, so its job is to phosphorylate. Typically the things that it phosphorylates are going to be directly related to what hormone binds. So in the case of an adipocyte, which is storing triglycerides, right? Then protein kinase A upon activation by a hormone like a norepinephrine or cortisol, is then going to go ahead and it's going to do two things. It's going to activate hormone sensitive lipase. And so a lipase, of course, is an enzyme that does what? Breaks down who into who? Digest lipids to triacylglycerols. So that would be that would be more like like bile salts. Would emulsify lipids to triacylglycerols, and then we would have lipases digest triacylglycerols into. So if we're talking about like the intestinal lumen, for instance, we would have triglycerides that are trying to enter the cell to be absorbed, go into circulation, and typically what's going to happen is a lipase will cleave off two of the fatty acids and those fatty acids will be absorbed into the cell and leaving one monoglyceride and the monoglyceride will then also enter into the cell. And then our fatty acids and our glyceride or our glycerol or a monoglyceride can then enter the circulation. And so that would be in digestion. In this case, a couple of things are gonna happen. And one of these you don't need to worry about. There's this uh, protein called perilipin. And apparently its job, at least based on this, I didn't really do any research on perilipin, it's not important for the MCAT, but it seems like its job is to sort of like surround a big fat droplet that's present in an adipocyte when it's phosphorylated by hormone sensitive lipase, sorry, when it's phosphorylated by PKA, protein kinase A, then it will shift out of the way, allowing access by the lipase, which will then cleave the fatty acid, the triglycerol, the fatty acids, the glycerol. Then who is transporting our fatty acids in circulation? Not all fatty acids would be soluble, depending on size. So short chain fatty acids are soluble in the bloodstream, so they can just be transported on their own. But long chain fatty acids need a helper guy. Who's the helper guy that's going to help them to be transported? Lipoproteins. So lipoproteins, that would be prior to lipogenesis. So then we're after lipolysis here. The lipoproteins will be involved in fat digestion as opposed to lipolysis. So we can see one of our buddies here, serum albumin, right? So albumin, its job is to carry lipids in the bloodstream. What's another type of lipid that albumin can carry in the bloodstream? Cholesterol and other steroids, right? The steroid hormones need to be carried by uh, most, at least the vast majority of steroid hormones need to be carried by albumin in the bloodstream because they are too hydrophobic, they're too water insoluble. And then when we get to a myocyte, so we have a muscle cell, they can enter via a transporter, or in some cases they can diffuse through the membrane, but I think it's more commonly recognized that fatty acids use transporters to get into the cell. And once they're in the cell, then they can undergo things like beta oxidation and then eventually citric acid cycle and electron transport chain, where we're getting most of our energy, our ATP from fatty acids. Questions on this slide? Okay, so we've talked about now, how do the fatty acids get into the cell? Now let's talk about what happens once they get there. So we'll start here in the cytosol, and then we'll work our way into the mitochondrial matrix on the next few slides. This is sort of our overview, and this is gonna have to do with the carnitine shuttle. So the first step of fatty acid 
um, getting into the mitochondrial matrix would be fatty acid activation. And this is done by an enzyme called ACL-CoA synthetase. So with ACL-CoA synthetase, it is taking two, adenis it's taking two ATP equivalents in order to attach fatty acid to coenzyme A. So we have coenzyme A entering here. And I only see one ATP. So why is this two ATP equivalents? So how many how many phosphates uh, bonds are cleaved? Cleaving off a pyrophosphate. So that's why they call this two ATP equivalents. I was actually confused for a really long time when I would see them saying two ATP equivalents and I'm like, where's the other ATP? So technically there are two ways we could have two ATP equivalents. We could have two ATPs making two adenosine diphosphates or we could have one ATP going to adenosine monophosphate and cleaving off a pyrophosphate. So this counts as two ATP equivalents. And here's coenzyme A structure. So we went over the structure of NAD, FAD. Oh yeah, is, I think it's cool too. Uh, we went over the structure of, uh, that we, of NAD, NADP, and FAD last week. So, and uh, as well as ubiquitin, sorry, ubiquin known and ubiquinol. This is another good structure to know, or to be, not to just, I mean, not to be able to draw, but of course, just to be able to recognize. So with coenzyme A, we have sort of like a tail here, which looks like it was probably derived from amino acids, we could guess. And then we have two phosphates here. We have a phosphate here on the three prime and we have which nitrogenous base? Which nitrogenous base would that be? Would that be adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, uracil? So that's gonna be an adenine. The way I like to remember adenine versus guanine, of course, we know pure as gold and the purines have two rings. And the, the way that I like to remember adenine is that adenine is all amines. So we, it has no like carbonyls. Yeah, there's C double bond O is the difference. So guanine is the one that has a C double bond O. So adenine, all amines. Yeah. I like to make my mnemonics as like, intuitive as possible. If I can make a mnemonic just simply out of the name of something, like that's that's the best way to go. So the enzyme here is gonna be acyl-CoA synthetase, which is going to be a ligase. Let's see, got it. Uh, just keep your, keep your mic muted if you're not talking. Um, and then we have a ligase here is linking coenzyme A to fatty acid, to ATP equivalents. Coenzyme A's job is to be a carrier molecule. So now that we've linked this to coenzyme A, we have a high energy thioester bond. What is it that makes a thioester a high energy bond? So the hydrogen, no. So sulfur, is sulfur like a good leaving group? So when sulfur leaves with a minus, is it able to stabilize that minus? That's a good leaving group, large. Good, exactly. So it's large and therefore it has a delocalized charge, exactly. So sulfur is really good at leaving uh, because when it leaves, it's a larger atom. So it has the ability to delocalize that negative charge due to its size. And then another reason which may not be as obvious is all carboxylic acid derivative, derivatives will have resonance, which will help stabilize them to varying degrees. However, the larger the leaving group of the carboxylic acid, the less able it is to make a, a double bond with the carbon here. So because sulfur is so much larger than carbon, it's not very good at making that double bond. So it's not very good at doing resonance. And so it's a less stable carboxylic acid derivative. And that's also going to lead to it being a high energy functional group. Does that make sense? Any questions? Sounds good. Is it uh, considered a sort of strain? You would like, I'm not sure if that we could say scientifically it's a type of strain, but like colloquially speaking, it could be like, seems a little strenuous. 
basically it's not, it's not as good as atoms like oxygen and nitrogen, which we would have in esters, carboxylic acids, and amines. With oxygen and nitrogen, they're a lot smaller, so they're able to easily make a double bond, a pi bond with carbon, so they're able to resonate better. Yeah. And so um, ACL, like we said, is going to refer to any carboxylic acid derivative, such as in this case, a thioester. Any questions on this slide? So we're activating our fatty acid, preparing it to enter the mitochondrial matrix. Requires two ATP would be the takeaway here. And the name acyl-CoA synthetase is a good one to remember. So then fatty acid translocation can begin. So then, now remember the outer mitochondrial membrane is, is fairly porous to smaller molecules with the exception of, of well, larger molecules such as proteins will need actually transporters to get into the mitochondria um, and even the intermembrane space. However, the outer mitochondrial membrane, which is represented here, and this is cytosol, remember? Outer mitochondrial membrane is per permeable or porous to smaller molecules. So the purpose of having this Carnitine acyl transferase here isn't just isn't so that we can get the fatty acid into the intermembrane space or through the outer mitochondrial membrane. As we'll talk about in a moment, the inner mitochondrial membrane is, a, is impermeable to pretty much everything except for small nonpolar molecules. So the purpose here of linking this to carnitine is that we're going we're gonna to see in a moment there's a carnitine shuttle with specific 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 uh, specific recognition of carnitine, which will allow it to get the fatty acyl carnitine once we've linked it into the mitochondrial matrix. So we're linking fatty acid to carnitine. This is what carnitine looks like. Carnitine is going to be another uh, carrier molecule, just like coenzyme A. The enzyme here is carnitine acyl transferase 1. Not sure it's super important that you know that name, uh, but it should be fairly straightforward to remember if you remember that it's an enzyme that links carnitine. It's transferring a carnitine. So fatty acids now in an ester form with the hydroxyl of carnitine. And so one interesting thing that we're going we're gonna to come back to this later, but for now, malonyl-CoA, which is involved in fatty acid synthesis, as opposed to beta oxidation, which is what we want to do, malonyl-CoA is a molecule involved in fatty acid synthesis, and it's going to inhibit this, out, this first step of fatty acid translocation. And the purpose of this would be if malonyl CoA is present, we want to do fatty acid synthesis. So we want to shut down things that are going to lead to beta oxidation occurring, such as this carnitine transferase. Does that make sense? In other words, we don't want to be running beta oxidation and fatty acid synthesis at the same time, because that would be pointless. We call that a futile cycle. And the so dominance of anabolism over catabolism. So when we're trying to build up fatty acids, we don't want them to just go into the mitochondrial matrix and get degraded immediately. Questions here? And then step two of fatty acid translocation. So we linked our fatty acid to carnitine. So we have our fatty acyl carnitine right here. And now we're gonna use the carnitine shuttle, um, this transporter here to transport carnitine-linked fatty acids across the impermeable mitochondrial inner membrane. Should make a lot of sense as to why the inner membrane is a lot more impermeable than the outer membrane. What would be a really big reason why we'd want a very impermeable inner membrane? The proton gradient, right, exactly. So we wouldn't want, for instance, protons to be able to go through. And so, it's a very impermeable inner membrane. And we have a carnitine, acyl carnitine translocase. <laughs> so that's the name of this guy. And what type of transport is this guy doing? We can see a fatty acyl carnitine enters the mitochondria. This is the matrix side. This is the intermembrane space. And then we're going to recycle the carnitine and send the carnitine back over here so it can help more fatty acids get into the mitochondrial matrix. So what type of transport is this? Antiport, good, yeah. Mm -hmm. Facilitated diffusion. I would actually say that, I think people were saying in my lecture yesterday, I gave this lecture yesterday for MCAP Rose. People were saying that antiport is not exclusive to secondary active transport, which is what I thought. Uh, and that antiport could be a form of facilitated diffusion. So because none of, none of this is like from primary active transport, we're not utilizing like a sodium gradient to transport our fatty acyl carnitines in, 
then this wouldn't be secondary active transport, but it certainly would be antiport. Carnitine's going out and acylcarnitine goes into the matrix. This is the rate limiting step in fatty acid catabolism. And that should kind of make sense because we usually want the rate limiting step to a given metabolic process to be at the very beginning. So we're not wasting any energy setting up steps for only for them to get shut down later. So this is the rate limiting step in fatty acid catabolism. And that should make sense as well, because if this is how we get our fatty acid in the mitochondria, and if once the fatty acid is in the mitochondria, it's just simply going to immediately go into beta oxidation, we would want this to be the reliving step because cytosolic fatty acyl CoA could be either used for fatty acid synthesis or if it goes into the mitochondrial matrix beta oxidation. There's two possibilities or two possible fates of a cytosolic fatty acyl CoA. So it should make sense that this is the limiting step because whether this is turned on and we want to do beta oxidation or it's turned off, we want to do fatty acid synthesis. Again, we don't want them both to be going on at the same time. So any questions here? This is, uh, this is important. They could ask you the limiting step in fatty acid catabolism. Are there regulators for this step? The main regulator that I encountered was that uh, when I was doing research for this, the main, the main regulating, fa the regulating factor that I encountered was malonyl-CoA, uh, but that was for the, the carnitine acyl transferase, or even, even before this step. And I don't know what stimulators there are for this. So I think that if there's no malonyl-CoA, meaning that we're not doing fatty acid synthesis, then any fatty acid that enters the cell would just undergo beta oxidation, um, unless we're in, for instance, an adipocyte where we want to store it instead. And then lastly, the carnitine will be exchanged for coenzyme A. So the whole purpose of carnitine was that we had this shuttle that recognizes carnitine only or carnitine linked fatty acids. And now that we have gotten our fatty acyl CoA into or fatty acid into the mitochondrial matrix, then we're just going to exchange it for a coenzyme A and then the carnitine can be recycled and help more fatty acids get into the molecule. And this is carnitine acyl transferase two doing really just the opposite of what carnitine acyl transferase one did. Now fatty acyl CoA is reobtained and is ready for beta oxidation. Questions here? And then here's an alternate diagram. I like this diagram because it shows sort of the pores. So remember that these fatty acyl CoAs can easily go through the outer mitochondrial membrane into the intermembrane space, but they cannot easily go into the mitochondrial matrix. So they will have a, they'll have to have carnitine in order to do that. Now, short chain fatty acids, for some reason, actually are able to just simply pass through the mitochondrial inner membrane, but I don't think it's important that you know that from the MCAT. It's more important that you know about the carnitine shuttle. Great. So um, now we're in the mitochondrial matrix. We have our fatty acyl CoA in the mitochondrial matrix. We can start beta oxidation. So overview of beta oxidation. Fatty acyl CoA enters the beta oxidation as soon as it's in the mitochondrial matrix. Remember, the late rate limiting step was the carnitine shuttle. So, as soon as the fatty acyl CoA is in there, we're going to start beta oxidation. Beta oxidation is going to occur in rounds. And so, for each round of beta oxidation, the fatty acyl CoA is shortened by two carbons, producing one acetyl CoA per two carbons of the fatty acid. And as well, one NADH and one FADH2 will be produced per round of beta oxidation. So we're getting some direct reduced electron carriers from the steps of beta oxidation. Then we're also getting an acetyl-CoA at the end of each round, which can then enter the citric acid cycle, where of course it's going to give us more energetic molecules, more NADH, more FADH2, and GTP produced. Each enzyme in beta oxidation is feedback inhibited by its intermediate product. So the product of each of these enzymes that we'll look at in beta oxidation is inhibited by, or sorry, the product inhibits the enzyme that made it. And so this is a very common mechanism as in, in a lot of metabolic processes. Uh, beta oxidation is also inhibited by a high NADH to NAD plus ratio and a high acetyl-CoA to CoA ratio. Why would that be? 
because if you have um, acetyl CoA, there's enough energy source. You don't need to oxidize uh, on fatty acids. Yeah, exactly. So acetyl CoA and NADH are both products of this beta oxidation process. So if we have a lot of NADH, if we have a lot of acetyl CoA, there's no purpose to running beta oxidation. And so beta oxidation will be inhibited. Excellent. Any questions before we get into DEETS? So then here's another diagram that I like from, this is from Leninger, Leninger. I forget, I've never heard that, anybody say that name out loud, so I don't know how to say it, but we do see sort of the shortening by two carbons. So each round of beta oxidation is gonna produce an acetyl-CoA, which can then enter the citric acid cycle where the carbons will be lost as CO2 and the electrons will be um, transported by NADH and FADH2 into the electron transport chain, which will set up then our proton gradient, allow us to make lots and lots of ATP. Questions here? All right, so then here is gonna be the steps of beta oxidation. So we're going to processively increase the oxidation of the fatty acid and then produce an acetyl-CoA. So if we started with 16, after one round, we'd be down to 14. Now the final round, so imagine we're starting with a 16 carbon fat, fatty acid. When we get to the final round, when we're down to just four carbons, we're going to run one more round of beta oxidation. And this final round will produce two acetyl-CoAs. So then what does this tell us about the number of cycles? Are the number of cycles or number of rounds of beta oxidation equivalent to the number of acetyl-CoA? Or are there less rounds than the total number of acetyl-CoA? Sometimes they're even, sometimes they're odd. Mm -hmm. We will um, talk um, about even versus odd chain fatty acids. Okay, that's different, okay. Because... Mm -hmm. So there should be one less round than the number of acetyl-CoAs, right? Since our last round produces two. So you can think about it in terms of an equation as number of carbons minus two divided by two. So for a, four, a 16 carbon fatty acid, you would plug in 16 minus two, you get 14 divided by two, and that should give us seven rounds. So again, the first six rounds will produce six acetyl-CoA, leaving a four carbon fatty acetyl-CoA, and the seventh round will produce two. Total, you don't count the last one, basically, because it's what is left. It doesn't need to be... Oh, yeah. okay, I see. It doesn't need another round, exactly. Yeah, okay. So 16, it can be, because I got ding ding U word for that, so I remember. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep, that's a common type of like beta oxidation question. Um, and so if we're producing se uh, eight acetyl-CoA, of course, if they're asking you for a number of rounds, one of the answer choices will be eight, but the correct one would be seven. Sorry, can you just reiterate one more time? I lost you for a sec. So you're saying that um, the you have an extra acetyl CoA, and so um, that's the discrepancy in the number. Can you just explain it one more time? Yeah, my pleasure. So, we're somebody asked me yesterday, like, what is the purpose to setting up all these oxidative steps in beta oxidation, which we're going to talk about in a moment? Why don't we just cleave off the acetyl CoA immediately, and then we'll start working on the rest of the chain? So the problem is fatty acids, unlike glucose, don't have a lot of functionalizable groups, right? We've got the carboxylic acid head or the thioester head when it's linked to coenzyme A. And the rest is just a high carbon tail. Now, how many hydrocarbon reactions do we know? Not a whole, uh, <laughs> not a whole lot. Um, yeah, and for the MCAT, there are no um, hydrocarbon reactions other than like reduction of alkene to alkane, which is like H2 reduction. So the, and this is like a really elegant solution the cell came up with for the problem of how do we functionalize a hydrocarbon tail that's just um, basic B word carbons. Then, so the way that we do that is even though we already have an acetyl-CoA, which can then, enter, like if we were to just cleave this off, we get an acetyl-CoA, we'll start working on the rest of the chain since we have a functionalizable group here, we can help functionalize these carbons in preparation for when this acetyl-CoA leaves, such that when the next acetyl-CoA leaves, we have a carbonyl S-CoA, we have a thioester, so that we can keep working on this 
uh, this chain later on. So by the time we get down to four carbons, so imagine this is just four carbons, the R group is, not, is nothing, it's just a CH3 group. So imagine this is four carbons. In the very last step, when we have coenzyme A enter, we would make one acetyl-CoA here and then one acetyl-CoA here. So that answer your question as to why there's less rounds? Yes, so one acetyl-CoA enters um, and then we create another one. So the first one that enters is the discrepancy in the number. Kind of, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, it's it's that like we're gonna end up with a thioester CoA at the end of the beta oxidation round. So, but if there's only four carbons, then when we lose a two carbon acetyl CoA, all that's left over is another acetyl CoA. That makes sense. Okay, thanks. Yeah, my pleasure. So then we can apply our, our formula 16 minus two for a 16 carbon saturated fatty acid and we get 14 over two, we get seven rounds. Any other questions while we're on this slide? All right, let's talk about the first reaction of beta oxidation, which is performed by acyl-CoA dehydrogenase. Based on the name, what do we think this acyl-CoA dehydrogenase is going to do? Oxidation, so dehydrogenase enzymes oxidize their substrate and they reduce what? Either dehydrogenase enzymes will reduce who in order to oxidize their substrate? An electron carrier. An electron carrier, excellent. And so we can see here with our alpha and beta carbon. So remember, when it comes to alpha, beta, sort of like nomenclature, we start with a carbonyl and we start counting away from it. So the first carbon over is an alpha carbon. The second carbon over is a beta carbon. I'm not gonna hear a lot about a gamma carbon, but we could call this a gamma carbon. So this enzyme will begin by oxidizing the alpha beta carbon bond. It'll take a hydrogen and uh, from each of these carbons and then it'll take away two electrons to reduce FAD to FADH2. So the alpha carbons are dehydrogenated. And this is similar to the product of which OCHEM reaction? We have an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl. This is similar to the product of which OCHEM reaction? Aldol condensation, excellent, yeah. We have an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl. This is gonna be one of our themes from all of metabolism is when a carbon to carbon bond gets oxidized, instead of NAD plus, we get FADH2 as the reduction product. Whereas when we oxidize carbon to oxygen or carbon to sulfur bonds, we get NAD plus reduced to NADH. This has to do with electronegativity differences. Since carbon and carbon, when they're getting oxidized, they are losing electrons, but they're not gaining a bond to a more electronegative atom, such as oxygen, such as sulfur. So we get, we have a lower oxidation potential of a carbon to carbon bond compared to a carbon to oxygen bond or a carbon to sulfur bond. Then we reduce an electron carrier that has a lower reduction potential, which is FAD to FADH2. And ultimately we're gonna get less ATP from that. Does that make sense? We got 1.5 instead of 2.5. Does that make sense? Any questions? Um, the lower oxidation potential is because, is it because the when it's to the more electronegative one, like oxygen and carbon, um, the electrons are being withdrawn from carbon? Is that exactly. why? Yeah, exactly. So when you uh, gain a bond to a more electronegative atom, that is a higher oxidation potential. Okay. Because the electronegative atom is going to steal more electrons from the bond that you're making with it. Yeah. Whereas okay. these carbons are kind of sharing the remaining electrons evenly. So there's a lower oxidation potential. Okay, got it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And this is similar to which citric acid cycle reaction or which citric acid cycle enzyme? Which step of the citric acid cycle is this most similar to? Um, 
there's only one step that produces FADH2, right? Is it succinate to fumarate? Succinate to fumarate, perfect. So succinate dehydrogenase is another enzyme that oxidizes a carbon to carbon bond and reduces FAD to FADH2. Now, do you remember, is succinate dehydrogenase, is that just like a free floating enzyme in the mitochondrial matrix? Or is that bound somewhere? It's not, it's free floating enzyme, right? It's actually a participant in the electron transport chain. Good, good. So succinate dehydrogenase, actually remember, if we remember, it has FAD inside the protein. And this is, a com yeah, it's complex too, excellent. So succinate dehydrogenase has FAD in the actual protein itself. FAD and FADH2 are not like free floating electron carriers in the way that NADH is. So we're never gonna see like a free floating FADH2 produced when we reduce an FAD. These guys are protein associated. So then the question becomes, of course, if this acyl coenzyme A dehydrogenase is part is in the mitochondrial matrix, how do we get the electrons into the electron transport chain if FADH2 is not mobile? So unlike NAD plus or NADH, FAD and FADH2 has so far been enzyme bound, not free floating. And this is just for fun and for reinforcement of other metabolic processes. This is one of those things that, you know, your boy likes to include, not because it's super important, but because it's going to help us tie this into our prior understanding, our prior knowledge. Recall that NADH enters the electron transport chain at complex one, which is a proton pump, and then we'll reduce coenzyme Q from complex one. Whereas in succinate goes to fumarate, as y'all said, it's part of the complex two. And so FAD is bound to complex two, to the succinate dehydrogenase enzyme. And FAD is then going to transfer its electrons over to, as we talked about, iron sulfur clusters. And then iron sulfur clusters will transfer the electrons to coenzyme Q. So FAD never left the enzyme, never left the protein. We also talked about the glycerol shuttle as well. And so glycerol free phosphate that's cytosolic will enter into the glycerol shuttle and will have FAD just be a part of that enzyme and transfer its electrons directly to coenzyme Q. So likewise, our fatty acyl-CoA, when it enters into and gets oxidized by acyl-CoA dehydrogenase, then gonna transfer its electrons over to this other protein. And again, this isn't super important, electron transferring flavoprotein. And so electron tra trans transferring flavor protein also has an FAD, FADH2 in it. And then this guy is gonna then transfer its electrons over to an FAD from, we have electron transferring flavor protein, coenzyme Q, oxidoreductase, which is associated with the membrane and then can reduce coenzyme Q. So ultimately the takeaway here is that all FADH2 electrons get transferred into the coenzyme Q, we call it pool inside the mitochondrial intermembrane, in inner membrane. So questions here. And then coenzyme Q, of course, is gonna pass the electrons on to complex three. Any questions on this slide? Again, nothing really to memorize here, just to kind of tie this to other things that we've covered. Next enzyme in beta oxidation will be enoyl CoA dehydratase. Uh, Anybody remember what kind of enzyme is a hydratase? Be an oxidoreductase, would it be a ligase, lyase, transferase? Um, what am I missing? Or that's a lyase, baby. That's right. So hydratase enzymes are enzymes that use water to hydrate double bonds and hydratases will be a type of lyase. So it's catalyzing an addition reaction. Remember, we can always recognize addition reactions because they, they have two components, the gain, of a bond, the gain of a sigma bond, which will be to the water and to the hydrogen, and the loss of a pi bond. So we're losing this alkene. And this is similar to which OCHEM reaction? Or the, the product here, the beta hydroxy, so alpha beta hydroxy is similar to which OCHEM reaction? Not alkenes to alkenes as much as anybody remember memorizing in a OCHEM reaction, a beta hydroxycarbonyl is one of the main like intermediates. 
hint, it's actually one we talked about already in the previous one. So the aldol again, right? So the beta hydroxycarbonyl is going to be uh, is going to be the first product in an aldol condensation. It's the addition product, and then the alpha beta unsaturated is the condensation product. And that would kind of make sense because if we went the opposite direction, if we went up, and we eliminated a water, we would be doing the le the rest of the aldol condensation, the condensation part, by losing water and gaining a double bond. So again trying to make connections between things that we already studied, such as aldol condensation, with things that we haven't gotten to yet, which is metabolism. Somebody was asking me also, why is it called an enoil? So this OYL suffix is associated with carboxylic acid derivatives as well, just like acyl. So kind of like an enol, um, an enoil is when you have an alkene next to a carboxylic acid derivative. So that's the reason for this name enoil. And this would be analogous to which citric acid cycle step? Which citric acid cycle step involves a alkene going to hydrate it by an, and becoming an alcohol? Fumarate to malate, excellent. And it's catalyzed by fumarase. So this is similar to the fumarase step in the citric acid cycle. So again, making lots of connections between things we've already covered. And notice this is also no, there's no energy input or output. This step is energetically neutral-ish. So we're not gonna make or use any ATP. We're not gonna make or lose any electron carriers. Questions here on our hydrotase. And this is going to set up the beta, hydro, the beta uh, hydroxyl for further oxidation. Now next is going to be beta hydroxyl CoA dehydrogenase. So remember we have a beta hydroxy. You know, a dehydrogenase enzyme is an enzyme that oxidizes a substrate and reduces an electron carrier. So here, what type of bond is being oxidized? Carbon two. What type of bond is being oxidized here? A carbon bond to oxygen, right? So we are going from an alcohol to a ketone. And so remember, when we oxidize a carbon to a more electronegative atom, that has a higher oxidation potential. So we can reduce a better electron carrier, which is NAD plus to NADH, which is then going to get us more ATP later on in the electron transport chain. So we have beta hydroxy. Don't worry about the D versus L here. It's not important, that's beyond scope. We end up with a beta keto acyl. This is analogous to which citric acid cycle reaction? Kind of just going over the, the last few steps, right? So this would be the next step of citric acid cycle, which is malate to acetate. Yep, so this is analogous to the step that's catalyzed by malate dehydrogenase. And likewise with our theme, when a carbon oxygen bond gets oxidized, NAD plus gets reduced. Questions here? And then our last step of a round of beta oxidation is thiolase, which is also known as acyl-CoA acetyltransferase. So in this, this enzyme is going to, of course, be a transferase. I'm not going to insult your intelligence by actually asking you that. Um, it's a transferase. And it's what it's doing here is it's transferring a coenzyme A to break off the sort of like the acetyl-CoA on the end. And now what we've set up is another sort of like end acetyl-CoA will go on and we will oxidize further carbons in the same steps of the beta oxidation until we're down to four carbons. So it uses coenzyme A transfer to catalyze cleavage of acetyl-CoA. And again, the acetyl-CoAs are going to enter to the citric acid cycle. And it's very convenient, right? Beta oxidation is in the mitochondrial matrix and the citric acid cycle is also in the mitochondrial matrix. So we don't have to transfer from one compartment to another. The acetyl-CoA is free to simply just go ahead and enter into the citric acid cycle. Questions here? 
So we're done with um, a saturated fatty acid, at least for the, the steps of beta oxidation that are important for a saturated fatty acid. Now let's talk ATP yield. So ATP yield for a 16 carbon fatty acid. Remember, first we have to activate these, the fatty acids so that we can get it into the mitochondrial matrix. This costs us two ATP. So it's similar to sort of the investment phase of the glycolysis uh, series of reactions. And as we said, a 16 carbon fatty acid that are gonna, gonna undergo seven rounds of beta oxidation. And so per round, we make one NADH, we make one FADH2. So if we were to multiply over our number of ATP per NADH, we would do seven times two, which is 14, seven times a half, which is three and a half. So 14 plus three and a half gives us 17.5. And seven FADH2 gonna be multiplied by 1.5. So seven times one is seven, seven times 0.5, 3.5, seven plus 3.5 gives us 10.5 ATP. Okay, so these are the NADH and FADH2 generated directly by beta oxidation. However, remember, we're actually also generating all these acetyl-CoA, which are then going to enter into the citric acid cycle. How many NADH do we get in the citric acid cycle? We get three NADH in the citric acid cycle. So then remember our eight acetyl-CoA, so we take 16 over two, is then going to enter into the citric acid cycle. So for three NADH, we get 24 NADH from all of our acetyl-CoA. And then we would multiply again by 2.5 ATP. 24 times two, 48, 24 times a half, 12. So 48 plus 12 gives us 60 ATP. And then we would get one FADH2 from citric acid cycle. We would end up with F, eight FADH2s. Eight times, eight times one is eight, eight times 0.5 is four. And then eight plus four gives us 12 ATP. And then we also get GTP to like substrate level phosphorylation of GTP. And we would therefore get eight ATP equivalents in the form of GTP. Add it all together at 17.5 plus 10.5, carry the half, we get like seven, we get 18 plus 10, so 28. 28 plus 12 gives us 40. 40 plus 60 gives us 100, 108. And then minus two for the input gives us 106 ATP for 16 carbon fatty acid. Any questions on ATP calculations for saturated fatty acids? Cool, yeah, fairly straightforward. If we know all of our other cycles, then we can certainly calculate the number of ATP for saturated fatty acids. Now let's talk about what's different when we have unsaturated fatty acids. And we're not gonna go through all the entire steps again, we're just going to focus on the differences now. So how would a monounsaturated fatty acid going through beta oxidation be different from a saturated fatty acid? Remember, monounsaturated fatty acid tells you how, how many double bonds you have. You would have one carbon-carbon double bond. So would that limit the number of acetyl-CoAs, NADHs, or FADH2 that we get during beta? What would that limit? Recall that the carbon to carbon double bond is present after step one of normal beta oxidation. So the non-saturated fatty acid, we're losing out on one, what? Normally our first step, which was acyl-CoA dehydrogenase would give us a carbon-carbon double bond and we would get a, an, a, an FADH2 out of it. So because we already have a carbon-carbon double bond present, we're going to lose out on one FADH2. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, however, in this case, uh, we, this oleic acid, when we get to, so we're gonna do the normal, here's one round of beta ox, here's another round, here's another round. And once we get down to, towards this double bond here, is this in the right location? Is this between the alpha beta carbon? It's not, right? So we have the alpha carbon, we have the beta carbon, we have the gamma, yeah, it's between the beta gamma. So then we'll have this isomerase come in and this isomerase is going to move, just simply move the double bond between the alpha and the beta. So now this looks like 
how the, the amino acid, the fatty acid would look after step one of beta oxidation. And so we're gonna lose out on this FADH2. So one less FADH2 would be produced compared to a saturated fatty acid. Any questions on unsaturated fatty acids? Oh, I'm sorry, Charlie. I definitely missed out on something. How is it exactly we're missing out on an FADH2 if we're using a polymerase to make it practically normal? Yeah. So normally in step one, we're starting with a yeah. saturated bond between alpha beta, and then we're oxidizing the alpha beta carbon carbon bond to make the alkene, reducing FAD to FADH2. So those electrons from the alpha beta carbons are going to FADH2. But if the double bond's already present, we're not gonna get that FADH2, right? Right. So that's, so that's the energetic difference for a, unsat for a sat unsaturated fatty acid is that we would lose out on that FADH2, which normally would come from step one of beta oxidation. Okay, yeah, we don't cool, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Oh, be okay, because there's no hydrogen being taken off, it's just being moved around. The electrons, I mean. Yeah, the, yeah, the double bond just moved around exactly. Yeah. Thank you. All right, cool. All right, so that's how um, all the, so olive oil is marginally less fattening than butter. Oh, is that um, is that is oleic acid like olive oil? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, um, yeah, margin marginally. I like the use of marginally. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and then let's say. So this is the difference that we would we would see for unsaturated fatty acids, and then I'm I'm also I'm also guessing that it's not just the um, the presence of one double bond. So that's not a huge difference; it's just one FADH two, which would be one and a half ATP difference. So instead of like 106 or something, we would get 104.5. Um, there's another reason too, and it has to do with density. So this is a cis or a trans double bond. The cis double bond. Now, are cis double bonds? Um, do they do fatty acids that have cis double bonds? Do they pack better or worse? Where the, the saturated or the cis? The, the saturated pack better. Saturated packs better because it doesn't have the kink. So if we like draw out like a couple of these guys. And we were trying to like pack these compared to just a saturated fatty acid or a trans unsaturated fatty acid. So here we have a trans fat, here we have a saturated fat, and here we have a cis unsaturated. Cis unsaturated is actually packing the worst so it's less dense. So that's another reason. And that, that should make sense as well because olive oil is a, is a liquid at room temperature. And I guess butter, butter will so, sort of become like a gel <laughs> is between solid and liquid. Um, but if we think about something like Crisco, which has trans double bonds, Crisco is like a solid at room temperature. And I mean, technically butter being a gel is also a solid at room temperature. So um, long story short, cis unsaturated fatty acids are also gonna be less dense. So there's less energy per milliliter as well as getting slightly less ATP in the end. Does that make sense? Sweet. Awesome. That was a that was a good like connection to like real real life examples. All right. And then so our last sort of comparison will be with odd chain fatty acids. Now odd chain fatty acids are going to undergo the exact same steps as an even chain uh, fatty acid until they get down to five carbons. Because normally we'd get down to four carbons. And then we would get two acetyl CoA. When in the last step of a odd chain fatty acid, we make one acetyl CoA and one propionyl CoA. So remember, uh, when it comes to carboxylic acids, we have like formic acid, which systematically we could call methanoic acid for one carbon. Two carbons, systematically we could say ethanoic acid, but more often we call it acetic acid. Right? Three carbon fatty acid, which is what we have here, we have fatty acyl, could be known systematically as propanoic acid. 
but I don't know, because someone decided we should have two names for everything. It's also known as propionyl um, or pro propionic acid. So we have a propionyl CoA, a three carbon fatty acyl CoA. And so this guy's gonna be treated a little differently. And I don't think you need to memorize these steps. This is just to reinforce the steps that are important again. The propionyl CoA is going to enter in, it's going to be processed by propionyl CoA carboxylase. And it'll be converted eventually to succinyl CoA. We don't really need to worry about the steps that are going on here. Um, one thing we can see is that we're adding a CO2. So we're adding a carbon in the form of carboxylic acid. And that's what a carboxylase does, right? This also requires ATP. And then we have a epimerase. What's an epimer? Does anybody remember from OCHEM? What are epimers? Two molecules that differ with the type of diastereomer. What differentiates epimer from diastereomer in general? They differ at one chiral center. Yeah. They, so epimers are diastereomers that only differ at one stereocenter, such as glucose and galactose, right? And so this is an epimerase. What type of enzyme would that be overall? Like what, what sort of like larger category of enzyme would an epimerase be? Would it be a oxidoreductase? Would it be a ligase, lyase? Would it be a um, transferase, isomerase, or hydrolase? Isomerase, I think. Be an isomerase, right? And so we should be seeing that this, car, this uh, molecule is only differing at one stereocenter. So what it's doing here is it's swapping the position of the coenzyme A thioester goes here and the carboxylate goes here. So you do in fact have just one stereocenter getting inverted. And then lastly, this is gonna be processed by a methyl malonyl CoA mutase. What is a mutase type of? Oxidoreductase, ligase, lyase, isomerase, transferase, or hydrolase. It's an isomerase, yeah. So this is a type of isomerase uh, as well, which is going to, and a, so a mutase in particular is an isomerase that only catalyzes the movement or the trend, like the isomerization of a functional group. And so we are moving the functional group of coenzyme A, thioester, up a carbon, and then we get succinyl CoA. So normally, in the citric acid cycle, would the succinyl CoA enter at the same place as acetyl CoA, or would it enter later in the citric acid cycle? Yeah, it's going to enter later in the citric acid cycle. Cycle. Normally, what is the enzyme that causes that, that leads to formation of succinyl CoA? What's the enzyme? Is that succinyl CoA synthetase? Sounds like it should be. Remember, succinyl CoA synthetase takes a succinyl CoA and turns it into succinate and makes a GTP. But there's an enzyme that comes, so that succinyl CoA synthetase was named for the reverse reaction, remember. Uh, so, what is the one that makes succinyl CoA? Citrate synthase, isocitrate dehydrogenase, alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, succinyl CoA synthetase, succinate dehydrogenase. Pull up citric acid cycle real quick. Check it out. Would it be what comes before in the cycle? Yes. Um. Okay. So, you know, alpha ketoglutarate comes before, and isocitrate comes before that. Right. So. <laughs> it's gonna be our alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so normally, so succinyl CoA is going to enter the citric acid cycle here. So, how many? What do we miss out on compared to acetyl CoA? Do we miss out on some NADH being reduced? Yeah, exactly. We're going to miss out on an NADH here. We're going to miss out on an NADH here. Good. Um, can I quickly ask, you were saying that, oh, sesenyl uh, CoA synthase, oh, it sounds like it should be creating sesenyl CoA, but that's not necessarily the case is what you were saying? 
This is, yeah, succinyl-CoA synthetase is one of those enzymes in, in metabolism where it was named for the reverse reaction that actually occurs in metabolism because that's what was discovered first. Okay, so it's not for creating, it's for the reverse. Exactly, yeah. Thanks. So we miss out on two. Um, okay, so we actually, we're gonna miss out on the two NADH. We're also gonna miss out on ATP or we're gonna, we're gonna sacrifice an ATP in order to convert this into succinyl-CoA. And then we'll also make two fewer NADH, so it's five fewer ATP compared to acetyl-CoA. So therefore, odd chain fatty acids, so like, a, like let's say we had a 17 carbon fatty acid, would be six ATP less than actually than a 16 carbon fatty acid, which is kind of counterintuitive. You'd think if it's longer, it should make more, but it's actually not the case because of how odd chain fatty acids and propionyl CoA are gonna enter into citric acid cycle. So then uh, 17 carbon saturated fatty acid would make how many ATP? So if a 16 carbon makes 106 ATP, a 17 carbon would make only 100. Yeah, so seemingly counterintuitively, a, a, a odd chain fatty acid with one more carbon actually gets you less ATP in the end. Nice, yeah. Cool. Um, any questions on odd chain fatty acids? So what you should be aware of, you should be aware of the fact that there's a difference between odd and even chain fatty acids because we know that an odd chain fatty acid couldn't make simply acetyl-CoA. It's the way an even chain fatty acid could be. That's the main takeaway here. If you want to remember that the propionyl CoA that's generated could become succinyl CoA, that's not a bad idea. But yeah, those are the main takeaways here. And then, so these are not anything to memorize here. This is just for recognition. So common fatty acid names to recognize. The benefit of recognizing these names is that let's say you're on a passage where they're talking about a fatty acid, but they're not calling it a fatty acid, let's say they're calling it stearic acid. You're gonna have an advantage if you can recognize that stearic acid is a fatty acid over somebody who doesn't know that because you're gonna to get to that connection faster. So that's the benefit of, of not memorizing but recognizing some of these common fatty acid names. So we have acetic acid and butyric acid. We have lauric acid, palmitic acid, stearic acid, oleic acid, which some of y'all were already familiar with a couple of these linoleic acid and arachidonic acid. These are the most common, I would say, at least the, in terms of what I've seen the MCAT use. Also remember uh, that a physiological pH fatty acids are deprotonated. So they will have the carboxylate name. So if you saw something like sodium laurate or sodium stearate, you should also be thinking fatty acid or, or fatty acylate. So that's, that's it for this slide, any questions here? Eat. All right, so we're done with uh, fatty acid catabolism. Now we're going to do fatty acid anabolism, so building up fatty acids from acetyl CoA. So fatty acid biosynthesis occurs via acetyl CoA precursors. So we're going the opposite way. We're, we're making longer chains from shorter chains now. Oh, we're out of order here. Lipids are the main energetic stores for most organisms. And so that's the purpose of making fatty acids, is if we have abundant energy, we should be making fatty acids from our abundant, for instance, acetyl-CoA, and then storing that as triglycerides for later use. Remember, fatty acid synthesis is occurring in the cytosol, and this is beneficial because since beta oxidation occurs in the mitochondria, if we have the opposite process occurring in the cytosol, it's easier to regulate those opposing processes and making sure that they're not occurring at the same time. And we said this would lead to a futile cycle. Thank you. And so then acetyl CoAs here are going to be added as malonyl CoA. So this is one thing that's different about fatty acid synthesis versus beta oxidation. Beta oxidation produced acetyl CoAs. Acetyl CoAs are going to have to become malonyl CoAs first during fatty acid synthesis. And as we'll, we'll talk about exactly why that uh, or how that happens. So it's an anabolic reaction. Would that mean that it's oxidative or reductive? 
Yes, indeed, it'll be reductive. So anabolism is reductive. And so here's where we're using, one of the places we're using NADPH, which we previously generated in which metabolic process? So we don't make it in the citric acid cycle. We do make a lot of NADH in the citric acid cycle. A dose phosphate pathway, perfect. And so fatty acid synthesis, uh, what would that be stimulated by? Which hormone? So remember, doing synthesis, we have abundant energy. If we have abundant energy, then which hormone is most likely active? Insulin is good. Whereas it'll be inhibited by epinephrine and glucagon. So epinephrine and glucagon, the purpose of those is to mobilize energy so that the cells can break them down. And so fatty acid synthesis would be inhibited by epinephrine and glucagon, maybe cortisol as well. So you may be wondering, Charlie, if we're using acetyl-CoA to make fatty acids, where would we get that acetyl-CoA from? Because it wouldn't make sense to be using the same acetyl-CoA that, that we made from, um, the, from beta oxidation, right? So glycolysis in the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex will provide most of the precursors for fatty acid synthesis. So after we've done glycolysis, we've gotten pyruvate, and after we've oxidized pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, this is in conditions where we have a lot of sugar, we can then actually store a lot of that sugar as fat. So that's why for, there was like a whole, there's all these diet crazes, man, like, um, like a high carb diet, it actually can make you fat <laughs> because you're actually storing a lot of those carbohydrates after processing them through glycolysis and PDH, you're storing them as fatty acids. Remember, you can make fats from glucose, but you can't make glucose from fats. And where in the body would be the major two sites of fatty acid synthesis? So one of them's an organ, one of them's a tissue. Liver and adipose, excellent. Yep, liver and adipose tissue. Questions here before we get into some details. Sweet. So step one in our fatty acid synthesis pathway will be acetyl-CoA carboxylase. Acetyl-CoA carboxylase will add a CO2 to acetyl-CoA. And here's our reaction for that. We have our acetyl-CoA combining with bicarbonate. Remember, it's easier to have CO2 be added by a bicarbonate than to actually take a gaseous CO2 and add it, right? Which should not be um, as water soluble. This actually does require an ATP equivalent. And then we will make a three carbon molecule called malonyl-CoA. And this is coupling with hydrolysis of one ATP. What class of enzyme would this carboxylase be? If an enzyme that's joining two molecules uses ATP, be Oxidoreductase, reductase, lyase, ligase, yes, ligase, good. So ligase uses ATP to join molecules. And so we have this molecule, we have this enzyme, acetyl-CoA carboxylase is the overall enzyme, and it has two sort of domains. And we'll talk about those on the next slide. The purpose of the first, uh, actually, no, I think we're talking about them right now. So what will happen is we have this biotin, which is a prosthetic group. What's another name for a prosthetic group? Coenzyme, cofactor. Yeah. Um, and technically, biotin is going to be both, right? Because it's organic. So that makes it a cofactor and a co coenzyme. Yeah. Um, and so, what differentiates a prosthetic group from a cofactor coenzyme? Prosthetic groups, are they just associated with an enzyme? or are they very tightly held by an enzyme? So the way that I sort of like think about this, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, if you're an amputee and you have to have a prosthetic limb, would you want it to be loosely attached to your body or tightly attached to your body? Of course, you would want it tightly attached to your body so that you can use it to actually do things. Uh, so likewise, prosthetic groups need to be tightly attached to their enzyme um, in, order to, in order to best fulfill their job. Biotin's job here is to just hold on to carbon dioxide 
the first step would be ATP hydrolysis and biotin is going to hold on to carbon dioxide. The second step is a transferase. And the transferase, we see our biotin is shifting over here. So the enzyme undergoes a conformational change. And then acetyl-CoA will actually come in. And then biotin is going to hand off the CO2 transferase it to acetyl-CoA to produce malonyl-CoA. Questions here? So I think you should probably be familiar with acetyl-CoA carboxylase. You, not probably, you should definitely be familiar with acetyl-CoA carboxylase. I don't think you need to know the two domains. Um, and I don't even need, know if you need to know biotin's a cofactor or prosthetic group. Uh, but the main, the main idea here is that we're using an ATP to make a malonyl-CoA, which will then be used in fatty acid synthesis. A little more on acetyl-CoA carboxylase. So this is an important point as well with regards to this enzyme is that it's the major regulatory point in fatty acid synthesis. You definitely want to know that. And as we've talked about before, the reliving step or like the major regulatory points in a metabolic pathway are early on in the metabolic pathway. So that we're not putting in too much energy if we're not actually committed to doing that metabolic pathway. Uh, this, this enzyme therefore is gonna be regulated in two ways. It's gonna be regulated by hormones, first of all. And so insulin is going to activate acetyl-CoA carboxylase, which should make sense because we said insulin is going to stimulate fatty acid synthesis. And it will be deactivated by epinephrine and glucagon. Should also make sense because again, we want when we have those hormones present, we want to actually mobilize bio, uh, biomolecules for, uh, for energy purposes. It will also be all allosterically regulated. So acetyl-CoA carboxylase will actually be stimulated by citrate. Why would that be? Why would acetyl-CoA carboxylase be stimulated by presence of citrate? Yeah, so if we had a lot of citrate, right, then does that mean that we have a lot of energy or only a little bit of energy? Are we abundant in energy or are we deficient on energy? Yeah, we're, we have, we're abundant in energy, right? So high citrate concentration indicates the cell has excess energy, so it should store some. And this enzyme will also be inhibited by palmitoyl CoA, which was, would be just the palmitic acid with a CoA. Palmitic acid is the final product of fatty acid synthesis that we need to worry about. Um, and with our fatty acid synthase, our fatty acid synthase will keep making, elongating the chain until we get to palmitic acid. So in other words, we're inhibiting the first enzyme of fatty acid synthesis with the final product, which should also make sense. And so acetyl-CoA carboxylase would be analogous to which enzyme from gluconeogenesis? Close, close. So not PEP carboxykinase, but pyruvate carboxylase, pyruvate carboxylase, because pyruvate, pyruvate kinase would be the last step of glycolysis, yeah. Um, so pyruvate carboxylase is very similar to this, where we're turning pyruvate, three carbon, uh, three carbon sh uh, sugar acid, hold on. No, it's not a sugar. <laughs> um, pyruvate, three carbon carboxylic acid, is also gonna be adding a bicarbonate, elongating the, or, or making, the, uh, making the pyruvate into oxaloacetate, uh, which has one more carbon. So analogous to pyruvate carboxylase here. Questions on acetyl-CoA carboxylase? All right. Another one to be very familiar with for fatty acid synthesis is acyl carrier protein. So acyl carrier protein is going to be this protein that holds on to the growing fatty acid chain, as well as incoming malonyl-CoAs as carbons are added. So one of the things that's really nice about fatty acid synthase, which this is a part of, this acyl carrier protein, one of the things that's nice is all of the enzymes in fatty acid synthase can recognize growing fatty acid chains regardless of how many carbons they have. But there's, there's a flip side to that, which is that we don't want our growing fatty acid to leave the enzyme. Um, we wanna just hold on to it 
until we're done elongating it. And so this is the purpose of acyl carrier protein. It's to hold on to the growing fatty acid chain so it doesn't get away before we're done making it. So malleol CoA is going to end, add to the end here onto the thiol group in a thioester. Uh, acyl carrier protein also has a prosthetic group. It's a modified pantothenic acid, which is vitamin B5. Um, you can find, I mean, Energy drinks are a great way to recognize uh, vitamin Bs because they like to throw in a lot of B complex into the energy drinks. So like my, my Rockstar energy drink here has, uh, let's see, calcium pantothenate on it. So pantothenic acid will be the uh, prosthetic group. And I like to say that this acyl carrier protein is analogous to the P subunit of the ribosome. So remember the ribosome has the A site, which it accepts a, a tRNA amino acid has the P site where it elongates the chain, and then it has the E site where the, um, where the tRNA that's already loaded its amino acid will leave from. So this is very similar, because like remember, the, the A site is the entry point for a tRNA amino acid. And then the mRNA will be shifted or threaded through the ribosome, such that the tRNA is now on the P site, the second site. Another amino acid tRNA will come in, and we'll transfer over the amino acid from the P site to the A site, forming a peptide bond, and then rinse and repeat. So we like to hold on to the growing protein so it doesn't get away before we're finished with it. And analogously, acyl carrier proteins here to just hold on to the growing fatty acid so it doesn't get away before we're done with it. Questions on ACP? All right, so here's the overview of fatty acid synthesis. And so we're going to be doing a lot of similar, we're going to have a lot of similar intermediates as with beta oxidation. We have an entirely different set of enzymes, which I don't think you need to know these individual enzymes. We have an entirely different set of enzymes in order to do this. So recall that in gluconeogenesis, for instance, most of the enzymes in gluconeogenesis were the exact same as glycolysis, just operating in reverse, right? However, fatty acid synthesis uses different enzymes to catalyze the reverse steps of beta oxidation. Each round of fatty acid synthesis requires one ATP to produce malonyl CoA, two NADPH to reduce the growing fatty acid chain. And the purpose of having this NADPH be a part of this process is remember, we, our final product needs to be a carboxylic acid with a hydrocarbon chain. So the hydrocarbon chain needs to be completely reduced but we're adding carbonyl groups. And so we'll use NADPH, which we generated in PPP, pentose phosphate pathway, to reduce the growing chain. So eventually we just have one carboxylic acid head and a hydrocarbon tail. So questions on our overview here? Okay. So step one, we're gonna kind of go through these fairly quickly because you don't need to actually know the individual enzymes. The purpose of talking about the individual enzymes that you don't need to know is just to reinforce the intermediates of beta oxidation and just the overall idea of fatty acid synthesis. Our first step here will be beta ketoacyl ACP synthetase. It's a mouthful right there. So this is a synthetase, which is a lyase. And we'll actually have one acetyl CoA serving as a primer, very similar to uh, our glycogenin from glycogenesis, very similar to our RNA primer of DNA replication. And then we'll add malonyl coas to extend the chain. When the malonyl coa gets added, CO2 gets lost so that we're using a two carbon molecule and a three carbon molecule, getting them together, losing a CO2, we end up with a four carbon molecule. And so this will be the first step of fatty acid synthesis. And you should be familiar with this malonyl uh, coa and uh, ACP the fact that we're using three carbons to only add two. Also remember that malonyl CoA deactivates the carnitine shuttle so that growing fatty acids won't enter the mitochondrial matrix and undergo beta oxidation. So remember, we're, we're doing this fatty acid synthesis in the cytosol. Um, you don't need to know Claisen condensation in terms of OCHEM reactions, but if you remember Claisen condensation from OCHEM, uh, this reaction is actually a Claisen condensation which is like an aldol condensation, but with esters, or in this case, thioesters. 
Any questions on our first step of fatty acid synthesis? All right, moving on. Now we have beta ketoacyl ACP reductase. So we have a carbonyl, we have an alpha carbon, we have a beta keto. And so we're going to have a reductase, which is reducing the carbonyl using NADPH as the source of proton of electrons to a hydroxy. And we get a beta hydroxy now. So the beta keto is reduced to a beta hydroxy, which is the opposite of the third step of beta oxidation. And we already said that our NADPH comes from the pentose phosphate pathway. Questions on this step? Now we're gonna read, we're gonna do the opposite of the, the next step of, sorry, the opposite of the previous step, which is we're going to eliminate our water that we had added using the hydratase. So we have a dehydratase that eliminates the water from the alpha beta bond, giving us our enoil. Um, in other words, giving us our alkene. What type of enzyme would this be that does elimination? So addition and elimination reactions are catalyzed by lyases. Questions on our dehydratase here. It's nice lyases. All right, and then now we are going to finally reduce the double bond, which formation of the double bond was step one of beta oxidation. So now we're going to reduce that using an enoil ACP reductase. The alpha beta alkene is reduced using a second equivalent of an NADPH. One thing that's different, another or another thing that's different between beta oxidation and fatty acid synthesis was that recall that in beta oxidation, when we oxidized the carbons to make that double bond, we reduced FAD to FADH2. But here we're not using FADH2 to reduce the carbon-carbon double bond. We're using NADPH again, our second equivalent. And again, this is because FADH2 is not a free electron carrier, it's protein associated. So it's just more convenient to use NADPH for both reductive steps of fatty acid synthesis. Any questions here? So then continued synthesis is just simply rinse and repeat. So similar to beta oxidation, fatty acid synthesis is conducted in repetitive rounds. So after we've made our four carbon fatty acid, if we wanna to get to 16, we need to add 12 more carbons. So we'll add six more malonyl CoA's, we'll lose six more CO2's, and we'll gain 12 more carbons to get to a 16 carbon. Uh, the colon zero means no double bonds, means zero double bonds. And then we will have our 16 carbon fatty acid. In animals, saturated fatty acids, end, and in a lot of organisms, ends with a 16 carbon palmitic acid. So question, how many acetyl-CoA's, carbon dioxides, ATPs, and NADPH are required for palmitic acid synthesis? So starting with how many acetyl-CoA's would be required? Perfect, so eight acetyl-CoA's. And then how many CO2's would be required? Seven, excellent. So likewise, or, or similarly, for a 16 carbon fatty acid synthesis, we would need seven rounds of fatty acid synthesis. And because we had our one acetyl-CoA primer, we only need seven malonyl coa so we only need seven CO2s. Good, good, good. Oops, sorry, and then how many ATP would be required? Want to make seven malonyl coa We need seven ATP also. And then finally, how many NADPH would be required? So remember there's two NADPH per round, right? So 14 NADPH. Questions here? Sweet. All right, and then this slide is mostly just for fun or for reinforcement rather. And so, sorry, you're gonna have to, there was no way for me to fit this otherwise. Uh, so it's a little bit small, but um, so we, here's our fatty acid synthase enzyme. 
as you can see, it's a complex of one, two, three, four, five different enzymes, a multi-enzyme complex. Here's our ACP. And it also contains all the enzymes of fatty acid elongation. So we'll start by adding our acetyl-CoA primer to the KS subunit. Then we'll have our, and that's the synthetase. And we'll have our malonyl-CoA enter. It'll ditch the CoA. And we'll have now our malonyl-CoA linked to ACP. And what's happening here is this O minus is making a double bond with carbon. This is now gonna leave as CO2. And then when this bond breaks, it attacks the carbonyl here, causing it to ditch the sulfur. And we've now added from a two carbon and a two carbon, so we now have a four carbon molecule attached to our ACP. And then we'll start reducing it. We'll use our first NADPH equivalent to reduce um, on this side to an alcohol, or sorry, on this side to an alcohol. And then we will lose the water, we'll eliminate water, giving us our alkene. Then we'll produce the alkene using our second NADPH. And we will now have our alkane, oops, reducing the ketone to alcohol, eliminating the water to alkene, reducing the alkene using a second NADPH. We haven't talked about MAT yet. And then malonyl, isyl, malonyl acetyl transferase is then going to add the next malonyl CoA. And then we will just rinse and repeat until we're up to 16 carbons. Any questions on this slide? Cool. And we're getting close to the end here. So recall that for fatty acid synthesis, we also have number of carbons minus two over two. So we said with a 16 carbon fatty acid, there'd be seven rounds eight acetyl-CoAs, one as a primer, seven to becoming malonyl-CoA, seven ATP, seven CO2s, 14 NADPH. So here would be again our count for a 16 carbon fatty acid. Okay, so we are finished with lipids for now. Uh, next week, we're gonna go over steroid metabolism, ketone bodies, glucogenic and ketogenic amino acids, and the urea cycle. So some of our sort of miscellaneous parts of metabolism. And particularly when it comes to the ketone bodies and the glucogenic and ketogenic amino acids, those are going to serve to help link more and more of our metabolic pathways together into a more cohesive understanding. And then we will have completed MCAT metabolism. Any questions here? Uh, any questions while we're still recording? Sounds good. Everybody on YouTube, I will see you next week for our final MCAT Metabolism lecture.